thank you for joining us today for this important panel discussion. As you know, electric power is fundamental to any modern economy and impacts our lives almost every minute of the day. The infrastructure, the electric grid, which is only about 120 years old, was considered by the National Academy of Engineering as the most important engineering achievement of the 20th century. But in the 21st century, the grid is changing due to a variety of reasons. Climate stresses, as we saw what happened in Texas, cybersecurity, electrification of transportation, which is a tectonic shift in the auto industry, renewables integration. Renewables are the cheapest, one of the cheapest ways to produce electricity, and the grid was never designed for it, and many others. We are also in a moment of history where we have a president, President Biden, who's focusing on climate change and has an ambitious goal of 100% clean power by 2035. Given this scenario, it is important to understand how the grid could be changed and what does electric power mean in the future. To understand these changes and how we should plan for the future, the National Academy has created a committee to dig deeper into this which was led by Granger Morgan of Carnegie Mellon University. We have four distinguished members of this committee here to discuss the report and have a conversation with us. Anu Anaswamy from MIT, Sue Tierney from Analysis Group, Deepak Devan from Georgia Tech, and Anjan Bose from Washington State University. We will first go through a presentation of the report, and then I'll have a conversation with the panel followed by Liang Min, who is the executive director of Bits and Watts to take audience questions. So let me hand over to the presentation by starting with Arun. Thank you, Anj. Thank you, Arun. Um, we could go to the second slide. So as uh, Arun pointed out, uh, we are here to talk about this report, the future of electric power in the United States, uh, put out by the National Academies. And this was released in uh, February of uh, uh, 2021. So before we go into the actual report itself, um, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about the genesis. So if you could go to the next slide. So um, at the request of Congress, the Department of Energy asked the National Academies to basically evaluate what's the medium and long-term evolution of the electric grid. And they asked us to focus on technologies, uh, planning and operations, uh, business models, and uh, grid architectures. And our uh, first meeting was March of 2019, and we met several times, um, about maybe once every couple of months, um, leading all the way up to February of uh, 2020, and we seamlessly transitioned to a virtual mode after that. If you could go to the next slide. So these were the committee members that basically deliberated um, on how we can um, uh, put together this report. And um, uh, as uh, Arun mentioned, this is a very um, huge topic. And so it has lots of different moving parts uh, to it. And therefore the members who are involved in it really have a varying expertises in technologies and policies and regulation and in innovation um, in people processes uh, and so on. So all of us had to really make sure that that intersection of points of view um, uh, appropriately address the different um, uh, points that we needed to, to really express in the report. If you could go to the next slide. Um, this is a fast moving topic. And in fact, more than uh, uh, any other reports, perhaps this is the one that has been really timely because almost on the around the same time that we uh, released this uh, report is when if you could uh, hit return, um, was the extreme um, uh, weather-based um, incident that occurred in uh, Texas. And uh, um, partly for, uh, soon after that, we had the Biden administration's fact sheet, if you could hit return, um, uh, which really talked about expansion and modernization of the electric grid. And their targets 
uh, if you could hit return, uh, talks about fairly aggressive target of 100% clean electricity by 2035. And considering where we are right now, that really requires a fast paced set of actions that need to be taken. And one other incident that again occurred between, you know, the, the, these two short months, um, uh, hit enter please, uh, is uh, the uh, uh, colonial pipeline uh, incident that occurred. Because as we evolve towards the, uh, a, a more uh, smart grid that really is responsive uh, to various events, the cyber footprint increases, which means that we have to address some of these other challenges too. Uh, next slide. So all of these components, um, oh, and in fact, what I would like to do is to really focus on the specific aspects of uh, what the report considers. In fact, um, we're going to defer the topic of discussions related to weather incidents, et cetera, to this resilience report in 2017. Uh, and if you hit enter, you'll see that um, there are many aspects of what really leads to an extreme event and subsequent responses that are addressed in this report. And in fact, several members of this com committee were also part authors of this report, which uh, talks uh, more about the resilience aspects. So um, uh, going to our report itself, next slide. Um, uh, as I said, there were many moving parts to this. And so these were the different chapters that uh, helped us bring the whole story narrative in a cohesive manner. And we are here to just basically go over the highlights of uh, what is considered in this report with specific focus on the legal and regulatory changes, uh, as well as technologies and uh, tools. Um, next slide. So, the, uh, and again, um, given that multiple stakeholders are, are interested in the report, um, there are a huge number of recommendations that are directed to different uh, agencies, uh, DOE, Congress, uh, state entities, uh, FERC, and so on. And again, um, uh, I, for details, please do take a look at the report, but we will definitely be highlighting some of the key ones uh, that are pertinent to um, uh, 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 some of the topics in here. Next slide. So um, there are certain things that the, the, that I should be mentioned, which is that we do not really predict as to exactly how the grid will evolve because many of these predictions are really hard to do. And many of the times, even if you do it, it might be wrong or really totally inaccurate. So, but we do lay out ways in which it might evolve. And in all of these things that the central pillar is always that it remains safe and secure. But in addition, we need to really accommodate um, you know, given these uh, given major drivers, uh, how it can stay affordable, equitable, sustainable, provide clean power, and continue to remain re reliable and, of course, resilient in, in the face of uh, these uh, huge th emerging threats of high intensity. Um, next slide. So the start, starting of the whole thing really opens up with these report drivers in the report. And so the first four you can uh, recognize as you know many of the points that uh, Arun mentioned as well that the, uh, the current administration is, is focusing on that the whole world is in, involved in a dialogue in terms of deep decarbonization, electrification of demand, the changing uh, grid edge, and of course the rise of wind and solar. But we should also point out that the report really explicitly addresses some of these things that should be addressed as part of the whole discussion, which is a reduction of social inequities and what the overall um, impact is on workforce and how we can address training, retaining, retention, et cetera, and the globalization of, of the whole uh, landscape, including supply chains. So this sets the stage and then uh, we then uh, transition to how, will we, how can we embrace these drivers? How can we address the challenges and um, really address the uh, future of the electric power. And for that, let me hand it over to, to Sue. Thank you, Anu. I'm gonna talk a bit about chapter three, which is uh, characterizes policy, regulation, law, and those kinds of aspects of the architecture of the system. One of the things we talk about is the the fact that we don't really have, quote, a US electric system. We have a set of uh, institutional, political, uh, natural resource, and other aspects of the electric system around the country that really makes it highly regional and highly varied. So for example, these are the RTO footprints that I'm sure you're very familiar with. Next, please. And then these are transmission planning regions. There's some overlap and some not. So there's different influences going on in those places. Next. 
These are the footprints of the many, many electric co-ops that we have. And so we, we have really quite a patchwork quilt of investor owned and municipally owned and electric co-op organizations with boundaries that span uh, small areas and large areas and cut across these different regions. Next, please. These are the states that have now adopted greenhouse gas emissions targets. They make up a very large percentage of the US population and they are driving changes in the regions uh, in which they are located, not only because of state policies, but the utility commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in those footprints as well. Next. Here's a picture of those states that overlap in some sense with the ones I just mentioned. These are ones with renewable and clean energy targets. A lot of activity in a lot of different places. Next, please. These are the places where states have been undertaking both legislative and regulatory initiatives to try to get ready for opening up things at the grid edge and removing barriers and so forth. A lot of activity there that we discuss in the report. Next two, why don't you hit two slides. These are the final slides I want to show. On the right you see those are the states that have still today restructured their electric industries in one way or another. Dark blue shows those that we're the there are really truly wires companies and the lighter blue states are ones where there's a hybrid system, both traditional and uh, some competition is in place. That also complicates and opens up innovation as well as challenges across those uh, geographies. And then finally on the left, uh, this is a I think this is a grid wise alliance uh, map where they use an assessment system to try to just uh, recognize what states are doing with regard to grid modernization. And if you're blue on that map, you're called a leader by Gridwise Alliance. If you're white, essentially tan on that map, uh, you really haven't done a lot to open up things at the distribution level for new suppliers, new services, and so forth. So a lot of activity, a lot of change both at the bulk power, the legal, the political, and distribution system levels here. Next, please. I'm going to go through a handful of our recommendations in the legal and regulatory policy chapter. Here's, our, here's one of them. Uh, we observe that there is uh, that there are very large outages from time to time on the system, just as we saw in Texas recently. And we recommend that the, uh, the federal government establish a task force to see whether or not there are any new legislative authorities that are needed to make sure that the industry and the federal government can move as quickly as possible and as comprehensively as possible to understand what happened. Uh, and that is what happened as a result either of a physical disruption on the system or a cyber disruption. We note that there are plates, places in the transportation industry where the Federal Highway Transportation Safety Administration is, I think I'm getting the acronym wrong, where there is a fact-finding organization that is able to provide information and, co and really compel timely uh, provision of information from key players in the industry, make recommendations, and then the regulatory agency, which is separate. Uh, can decide what new standards and so forth are in place. And we think that would be useful in the electric industry as well. Next, please. Uh, yes, uh, recommendation 2.1 is something that uh, looks like we were a little bit prescient in some sense prior to the Texas outage. We note that the, uh, the electric industry has come a long way since the enactment of the Energy Policy Act of 2005 in setting up reliability standards and then monitoring compliance with those. And, and that's a relationship where Congress gave FERC the authority and then FERC established an uh, electricity reliability organization and things have been moving forward. There is nothing of that sort on the gas side. And to the extent that the electric industry depends these days so much on gas supply and visibility into the availability of gas. And in the future, as gas will be used not mainly for energy production, but also for balancing services, we think that uh, Congress should also authorize FERC to um, have this capability for 
the gas industry as well, and to designate some entity to set standards and assure reliability of the gas delivery system. Next, please. We spend a lot of time in our chapter on trans transmission. And uh, we, we don't think that work on transmission has kept up with evolution of the, uh, the markets for generation and so forth. And after a lot of de deliberation, we ended up making these recommendations for transmission, and these go to Congress. First, we think it would be very useful to actually articulate a national transmission policy. And this would not only focus on reliability and cost and affordability questions, but also make it clear that increasingly the supply of electricity is, is being driven toward a cleaner, lower carbon emission uh, portfolio. And in order to open up areas that have very rich resources, uh, renewable resources, such as offshore wind, um, high quality uh, solar uh, supply and so forth. We think Congress should say what is in the national interest with regard to using transmission assets to provide the system um, that is clean, reliable, affordable, equitable, and so forth. Then we think that FERC should do greater work to expand the policy bases for doing transmission planning. And that would include providing access to those high quality renewables. Right now, as you probably know, the Secretary of Energy has the authority to establish national transmission corridors and to approve interstate transmission lines in them. We think FERC should have that. FERC is a regulatory agency. And while the Department of Energy can do a lot of modeling and providing of evidence about the need for designation of such corridors, we think giving FERC that authority is really more in its wheelhouse. Um, and uh, we would recommend that that be the case these days. And then finally, if we are talking about giving FERC greater authority to approve transmission proposals, we think people on the ground need to have better resources to be, participate in the system, both tra transmission planning and siting. Next, please. Let me spend one minute talking about the distribution element of our chapter number three. We spend a lot of time talking about the fact that this is an area that is undergoing tremendous pressure for evolution, trans, uh, transitions, and change. Lots of customer-driven behavior uh, preferences, lots of technology office offerings and service, um, service innovations. And we think that state regulators should really accelerate what they're doing, both in piloting, um, developing different market designs that are creative, uh, removing barriers where they are standing in the way of cost-effective and efficient adoption of clean energy technologies. But we also know that there are some instances where there have been policies put in place in the past at the distribution level that really need to evolve. Uh, we point to net energy metering as one of the areas where that was really important for kickstarting the distributed energy resources market, but a lot more innovation is needed uh, in order to assure that there is a fair and equitable uh, progress. Um, and now let me just mention a couple of things about chapter four, please. Uh, chapter four, chapter four is our innovations chapter. And we spend a lot of time uh, analyzing factors that affect innovation and adoption of new technologies in the United States in the electric industry. There's these four factors are the uncertainty associated with future regulatory regimes, the highly regulated nature of the electric utility industry, uh, which affects um, innovation uh, inhibitions in some instances. Third, environmental concerns that are really driving the need for more innovation. And then finally, uh, we examine the changing nature of the innovation supply chain as well. And as part of this, one of the things we look at is the role of the federal government in R&D funding. And we note that in the United States, non-federal funding of R&D in the electric industry is 6% of the total dollars. Um, that's not a sufficient investment. Um, when in combination, you look at what the federal government is also spending, it's inadequate compared to what you see here. Now, the chart on the left 
shows that the United States uh, has been in real terms dropping its investment relative to what's been going on in every one of these other countries that we examine, both in Europe and Asia. Uh, and we think that the US is losing its competitive edge in terms of innovation uh, to the detriment of the United States in its long-term health um, for economic uh, manufacturing and a variety of other things. When you look on the right-hand chart to normalize those numbers for GDP, uh, the US is at the bottom of the list. And so we uh, recommend that this outspending really be addressed in the near term in this decade in order to be ready for changes in the decades ahead. So we recommend that basic research be doubled and that uh, demonstration um, research <laughs> research development and demonstration uh, be tripled relative to where it is today. Next, please. Finally, this is just showing you that curve. Uh, these are different estimates of where we are with regard to the billion dollar, billions of annual expenditures. The blip there in the post-2008 period is uh, the Recovery Act that occurred during that period. And we encourage that there be that kind of blip in spending so that the US can get to a position of really being a leader in this area again. I think we think our US electric industry needs to benefit from having many kinds of technologies and materials be homegrown. And now let me pass it to Deepak, please. Thanks, Sue. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion on technologies that happens in chapter five, uh, six, and then kind of a wrap up in uh, in seven. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the, the technology areas. I think we all agreed that uh, the system is on the cusp of uh, a major uh, fundamental transformation. But uh, unlike in the past, a lot of the factors are outside the industry's control. Uh, and uh, that's kind of uh, much harder for the industry to manage because they're kind of uh, uh, you know, reacting to it. Uh, also, I think if you look at the fundamental requirements the utility industry has operated on for, for decades, uh, we've added two requirements, which is sustainability and resiliency, which were not there uh, you know, in the past. And, uh, uh, and, and that again, changes the way that uh, we are uh, thinking and, uh, and, and reacting to, uh, you know, to everything. Uh, if you look at the uh, chart on the upper right, uh, that's just a learning rate for uh, for PV solar. It shows an exponential behavior in terms of uh, uh, falling prices and expanding volume, uh, and uh, that uh, you know is not just for solar, but it's true for batteries, it's true for semiconductors, it's true for communications. So a lot of different technologies of that kind, which makes it very very difficult to predict. Uh, the curve in the middle upper, uh, you know, shows you the uh, predictions made by the IEA in terms of uh, uh, growth of uh, of solar. Uh, capacity and uh, it's, it shows that you know every year they've had to kind of change the uh, the the, uh, uh, the assessment uh, you know and 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 so we we see that you know when you have uh, this level of uh, technology change happening in areas that you don't control it's very difficult to uh, you know predict uh, and as Anu had mentioned earlier I think some of the predictions that have been made by past uh, past uh, reports uh, haven't uh, necessarily panned out so uh, the uh, the committee I think uh, really focused on kind of uh, trying to uh, knit scenarios and uh, kind of show uh, evolutionary pathways that could occur that were driven uh, by the changes that we are talking about. Uh, we focused on a number of pivotal technologies uh, ranging from generation to storage to uh, power electronics, communications, grid management, uh, microgrids, and then uh, finally, uh, cybersecurity uh, as well. So let me take a couple of recommendations, kind of uh, work our way through that. I think we do recognize that, uh, you know, um, PV and wind, for instance, has started to become the lowest cost generation resources, but that's not enough uh, because we do need, uh, you know, zero carbon resources that have dispatchability, have the fast ramp, uh, you know, ramping capability uh, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, to fill in the gaps when uh, when PV and uh, wind are not, uh, not there. Uh, we also need to uh, kind of uh, make sure that there is uh, not only short-term energy storage available, but also multi-day and seasonal time shifting type of uh, uh, capability available. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's only with that and with uh, the dynamic control that you have on the grid uh, that the new grid is really going to be, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, manageable. The other thing that we kind of noticed is that um, 
many of the uh, technologies that are coming up now, whether it's PV or wind or storage, uh, they all tend to be more modular and more distributed, uh, and they have intelligence at the edge. Uh, and uh, this support, you know, this kind of suggests that the paradigm itself, uh, you know, may be changing, uh, you know, where we've uh, kind of come from a completely centralized, uh, you know, high level kind of top level, top down uh, command and control type of uh, system to one uh, which may kind of now start operating uh, differently. So if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, starting with uh, generation and storage, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, photovoltaics uh, is, uh, and, and wind are right on top of it, uh, you know, especially offshore wind uh, started to show some really good capacity factors. Uh, but I mean, whether it's CCS uh, or it's, uh, you know, direct air capture uh, or uh, uh, it's a uh, large scale sequestration of uh, CO2, I mean, these are all things, our, our, the committee felt that uh, all of the above was probably the right uh, approach to take at this point in time, especially in terms of developing, uh, because these technologies are moving so fast, you know, what will evolve eventually is not quite clear. Um, we see a, a role for hybrid generation plants uh, where you're combining storage with, uh, with generation uh, and uh, those things give you more dispatchability to the resources. Uh, we see uh, geo as a good, uh, you know, opportunity, uh, but also we are seeing a lot of interest and a lot of activity in uh, carbon-free uh, liquid fuels, such as uh, whether it's ammonia or hydrogen or uh, uh, you know, a uh, hydrocarbon that is made uh, using solar energy and uh, carbon dioxide from the air. Uh, SMR and uh, micro reactors, you know, tend to be also very uh, important uh, in terms of uh, uh, opportunity, but uh, we'll wait and see how that, uh, you know, is, uh, is panning out in terms of commercial availability. Uh, energy storage, uh, very, uh, very important. Uh, again, uh, we see that the short term is moving forward very, very quickly. We're seeing, you know, 100, uh, 150 megawatt type of systems being deployed in months time frame. Uh, we're, uh, you know, uh, also seeing that uh, hydrogen, uh, um, hydrogen has started to uh, be, uh, become meaningful in terms of uh, uh, extracting hydrogen from renewable resources. Uh, pumped hydro and conversion of hydro stations to pumped hydro looks very interesting and is, is also being uh, pursued. So, you know, we see opportunities here for balancing stabilization uh, of the grid. Uh, we see uh, opportunities in midterm uh, storage in terms of optimization and grid uh, operations. Uh, and, uh, you know, long-term energy storage really to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that uh, you don't have long periods of time when uh, you don't have uh, uh, the available resources. Prices are dropping. I mean, battery prices, uh, you know, were $137 a kilowatt hour in the, in the last year. Uh, expectation to go down to 100 and less in the next uh, year or two. And that, again, opens everything, uh, you know, up quite dramatically as well. Next slide, please. So here again, if you start, uh, you know, looking at what are the uh, the key technologies that are needed, uh, the committee felt that power electronics, uh, you know, is is one of the uh, uh, enabling uh, technologies for any number of different architectures that we looked at. In almost all of them, uh, to improve uh, asset utilization, to improve controllability of the resources, uh, it was uh, it was felt that uh, uh, you know power electronics at all scales, you know, going from uh, you know almost micro inverters to uh, high voltage DC, uh, you know, were required. Uh, to be able to uh, connect, manage, and uh, move uh, the kinds of power uh, that uh, you know that that uh, you know we're uh, uh, we're we'll talking about, uh, we we do uh, express a concern. We see that uh, there is a uh, a move towards a uh, high inverter-based uh, resource penetration systems that is uh, starting to happen already in in uh, in Europe. Uh, and we see that uh, as the number of grid connected inverters increases, perhaps to the millions, uh, you know, that uh, there are some new techniques that are going to be needed to ensure coordination between uh, the inverters uh, to make sure they do not do not interact with each other or with, uh, uh, you know, other uh, grid, uh, you know, assets that uh, that may or may not be there. Uh, and that uh, th these systems are able to kind of uh, operate in the face of resiliency, whether it's a loss of communications or it's a cyber, uh, you know, compromised uh, communications, uh, you know, how do you make sure that the system uh, actually is able to operate? Uh, big challenges in terms of interoperability, uh, in terms of standards that were lagging by six to eight years uh, in uh, technology cycles that were moving in two-year cycles. Uh, we didn't have, with so many vendors, we didn't have good plug and play uh, kind of, uh, you know, opportunities uh, and control, you know, proprietary controls were kind of starting to become uh, a little bit of a problem as well. So this is not a, a problem that has been solved. Uh, we are rolling things out very quickly, uh, you know, but uh, there's a lot of research that is required to be able to get to the bottom of how to make this happen and to find pathways by which this can be, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, implemented uh, commercially as well. Next slide, please. 
I think, you know, very important uh, kind of uh, discussion that I think was teed up by Anu and then a little bit by Sue as well, is this whole idea of uh, resiliency, uh, you know, that is uh, starting to come there. We've always talked about reliability from the bulk power uh, system level, but if you have five nines reliability in the bulk system, uh, you know, at the edge of the grid where all the customers are, you, you don't necessarily, uh, you know, have that. Uh, so, you know, uh, 5.4 really kind of uh, begins to explore this idea of a, uh, maybe a new paradigm where reliability and resiliency are achieved at the distribution system uh, level uh, with the uh, edge resources, with the distributed generation resources that are being deployed. Uh, and uh, the bulk power uh, system delivers low cost energy 98%, 99% of the time whenever it's there. Uh, but it, uh, it certainly allows uh, uh, you know, the, um, um, you know, the resiliency to be, uh, to be achieved. Uh, there's a lot of issues here, technical, economic, and regulatory that are not fully understood, uh, you know, or proven and, uh, you know, required to be, uh, you know, to be done as well. Um, you know, there was a, a discussion uh, in terms of uh, how do you enhance reliability and resiliency. Uh, today, we do black start and everything from the top down. Uh, maybe there's a way to do this where you have clusters of microgrids that function autonomously uh, under both normal and normal conditions. So if you look at the amount of distributed generation that is being deployed, there's enough to be able to provide that, but the technologies and the, uh, the standards uh, and uh, the commercial uh, you know, uh, mechanisms to make this happen are not there. Next slide, please. Uh, and finally, I think if you look at uh, some of the uh, changes that are happening, you know, very rapidly in terms of uh, uh, electrification of almost everything, uh, there's, uh, you know, the one that's uh, front and foremost is, uh, is really uh, electrification of transportation. Uh, we see very, very rapid growth uh, in, uh, you know, fast charging in terms of, uh, uh, you know, electric cars in terms of, uh, uh, you know, vans and buses and, and finally semis as well. Uh, and uh, this poses a very big challenge an opportunity in terms of how do you how do you manage to peak uh, to to uh, uh, fast charge such a, a fleet of massive fleet of devices in the next 10 to 15 uh, years? Uh, you might need as much as uh, the generation capacity of the U.S. if you were to do it, uh, you know, in a blind blind manner. So, what is the level of coordination uh, that is, uh, is 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 really uh, required for that? Uh, how do you manage a system like this? Uh, the distribution system has traditionally been dark. Uh, we haven't had much control on it, and yet all the activity is taking place uh, on the distribution uh, system. And the complexity of coordinating this very large number of generation assets and flexible uh, loads becomes, uh, you know, a very big, uh, big problem. Uh, if you see, uh, you know, distributed generation, there is enough uh, being installed now uh, at the edge to meet critical loads and high value loads. But, and that represents a pretty big uh, untapped uh, resource uh, to be able to help balance the uh, uh, system in real time, as well as to provide uh, resiliency. One last comment I want to kind of make out here, which will feed into the cyber discussion uh, that's uh, that's coming up, is when you have uh, millions of uh, of uh, you know inverters uh, that are trying to maintain the grid, there is a a dual requirement here where. Uh, from an operational point of view, the grid has to be maintained uh, in uh, in millisecond time frame, uh, and yet uh, you can have communication delays and cyber issues that uh, and you know kind of uh, disrupt communications. How do you kind of make the system continue to operate uh, you know in a, in a resilient manner? Is a, is a, is an open question uh, that needs to be addressed as well. So with that, uh, back to I think I know it's you, right? So as you saw from uh, Deepak's uh, presentation, um, the technology, technological advances are um, significant. Um, the, the technological advances have been occurring in generation and in, in, in loads, a, in EV, in supporting storage. And so given that these hardware technologies are uh, really increasing, um, of the appropriate management systems, appropriate software, the appropriate information and decision making also have to stay commensurate. And that basically is what we address in the second half of the chapter. So while uh, Deepak uh, mentioned um, and we, out, uh, we, uh, we articulate that in the report, uh, prediction is hard. Um, there are many different ways in which the grid can evolve, but one thing that may stay invariant to all of those evolutionary uh, scenarios is that the grid edge will get transformed. Um, uh, the grid edge, which has stayed primarily dark, as Deepak mentioned, passive, fixed, will change in terms of having more information available, more uh, generation available, and uh, more uh, 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 flexible loads available. And all of these things basically say that the grid edge in all of these evolutions will be transformed. And so given that, 
how do you make sure that you have an entire infrastructure that manages the distribution systems? And that basically is uh, some of the ch challenges that uh, uh, we outlined um, in this report and some of the opportunities. And as uh, Sue mentioned, um, uh, electricity markets, the, the decision-making structure, there needs to be appropriate changes at the policy and the regulation side. And commensurately, there needs to be appropriate technologies that may reflect the fine grain variations in the kind of, of um, uh, inputs that these distributed energy resources make and so that they can be appropriately incentivize and, and uh, encourage to participate in a market so that we do indeed have a reliable, resilient, and an affordable uh, grid. Uh, so that's uh, uh, those are some of the points that are, uh, have been addressed in this chapter. Next slide. Um, uh, again, the findings basically reflect that, that these as consumers adopt more, more uh, DERs. Um, how do you make sure that the information substrate and the controls and decision-making substrate is appropriately addressed? And, uh, and, and the point that uh, Deepak mentioned about coordination is going to be a non-trivial task, which means that there needs to be appropriate system-wide measures in place. And let's keep in mind that all of these things basically are been systematically validated and tested to say that this is indeed a whole process by which we can develop a roadmap for uh, this 100% renewable operation. And the slides on the right, for instance, show uh, that indeed uh, so that these are possible and this kind of coordination across the nation where essentially the technological challenges that you have to have balanced generation and load is indeed possible. But in order to do that, continued support and in, in, in um, developing these efforts in RD&D for coordination uh, using different kinds of ICT leading up to some sort of an ultra automation so that when events like the Texas event or the uh, colonial event happen, that we are able to bounce back quickly and safely and reliably. Next slide. Um, uh, the specific uh, mention should be made, uh, and, and that was what the purpose of chapter six, um, as to what the challenges are uh, when we open up the increase of the cyber footprint, um, and not just with communication sensing and I ICT, but also with cybersecurity. And we have to remember that um, uh, uh, bits and atoms follow different physics and therefore operational technology is different from the information technology. And so there's specific mention of what those challenges are, distinctions are, um, because these attacks can occur at multiple places. And this is what happened uh, in the colonial um, uh, pipeline ish in incident as well, as well as in the earlier Ukraine attacks uh, about uh, six, seven years ago. And so you, 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 know, you have to make sure that the vulnerabilities are protected, which means that it's not just a component-wide security, it's just, but the system-wide security that has to be addressed. And so different components are involved. It's people's processes and technology, and the chapter basically articulates what some of the challenges are in that context. Next slide. Now, given that you have these different components, we have to make sure that we have ways in which we can test these things. And so the pivotal tools here are modeling and simulation. And so the recommendations that we have in this chapter pertain to what kind of simulation tools have to be addressed so that things don't fall between the cracks. Next slide. And so in this context, there are a number of recommendations which actually are conveyed to a different um, agencies. And um, these recommendations basically pertain to what the uh, missing pieces are that we need to address and make sure that this grid edge challenges are, are really addressed across the board. So what all of this means is that we need to really uh, look at how architecture have to evolve. And I'd like to hand it over to Anjan to address those, those issues. Anjan? So um, this uh, set, the last four slides are on architecture. And as somebody mentioned right in the beginning um, uh, that uh, we are, uh, we were asked to look at architecture specifically. Now, uh, what does architecture mean? And uh, um, I think most of us use the word, but it's not always clear what we mean by architecture. But one of the things that we know is that the architecture of the power grid is changing very fast. And that's a concern. Uh, and so next slide, please. Uh, so let me, let me uh, tell you what, how the committee looked at the architecture of the power grid. Um, 
Now we know that the architecture is changing very fast because we know that a lot of new things are going on on the distribution system, adding up new distributed generation, active loads, uh, batteries, and so on. Uh, and so, uh, so one of the uh, layers of architecture is the physical layer itself, which is the green one at the bottom of this slide, uh, which says uh, generation, transmission, distribution. And that's what we normally think about when we think of the power grid. But increasingly, we are getting um, a, a whole layer of uh, ICT, sensing, communication, actuation, uh, uh, controls, computers, uh, overlaying this physical layer and that is becoming more and more um, uh, impactful on the grid. Uh, for example, right now, as, as somebody pointed out, uh, that there is not that much automation on the distribution side. It was mainly been passive for uh, several decades. But now with all the activity going on on the edge uh, of the grid, what is happening is we're the, the distribution side and including all the way into the house or residential or commercial systems, uh, the, the system is getting more and more digitized. And so we have to worry about that part as well. And then, um, the, uh, and on top of that, as Sue pointed out, uh, there's this whole thing about uh, the rules are changing, the, uh, the policies are changing and so on. So now we have to worry about how do we plan? How do we design? What are the, what, uh, the, of the power grid? And as you can, as it was said in the very early, the, the committee decided that we can't really uh, uh, forecast what the grid is going to look like because the grid is going to be very, very diverse as it always is today. Remember that uh, 20 years after uh, deregulation of generation, we still have large areas of the country which are still vertically integrated. Uh, similarly, we're going to have the same thing with the architecture in the future is that different parts of the country will be different and uh, depending on all of the issues that, that, that Sue raised under, uh, under her section. And so next slide, please. So um, uh, next slide. Um, and so if you can think of um, all the different kinds of architecture that may come about, uh, you can start drawing these diagrams where the different drivers, uh, 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 these are two dimensional dr drivers, so you can only see two drivers. Uh, in this case, the, the X axis is more and more of uh, transportation and other uh, manufacturing turns into electricity. So the more uh, electrification on the, on the uh, x-axis and on the y-axis is the is the more decentralization of generation control agencies and so on and so you can see that the today's system is somewhere in the bottom left hand corner and the, and the, depending on which one, which ones comes first you you can have different kinds of architectures growing next slide please so the main thing we i, I wanted to point out here is this issue of how do we study architectures? Uh, the pr and you, we need to study architectures or it, architectures make a difference in whether you're doing planning, operation planning, operations, if you're doing uh, training of, on simulators, these things all are, are impacted by the architecture of the system. And, the, and given that, the, that we have only one grid, which operates 24-7, we, the only way to study these things is by simulation. Uh, and so uh, we spent some time here uh, uh, talking about that. Next slide, please. And so I, I'll, I'll dwell on a, on a few uh, recommendations here, but actually because the, uh, you can think of many other architecture recommendations spread throughout the chapters. In fact, there is no chapter in the, in the report on architecture. But I've, I've taken pieces out from different parts of the, of the report to, to show here. And here's the, uh, the specific recommendations on how do you study architectures, how to be able to do planning uh, or, or, or operations or anything else. So the first one basically says that we are, uh, uh, the tools that we have in our disposal to do the simulation of these 
uh, ever increasing grid uh, is is not adequate in many ways. Uh, the, you know, I think we've already talked about the fact that with all the new technologies coming out, we you, uh, will have to have, that's a second recommendation here. You have to be able to model and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, sim uh, and simulate. Uh, and, uh, and also that the new technologies have to be somewhat transparent to the modeler, to the uh, simulator, because that's what the planners need to know, whether your uh, controls and, uh, uh, and all other things in the, all the uh, power electronics are going to operate in a particular way that's not going to uh, uh, disadvantage the grid in any way. The first recommendation refers to the fact that right now, uh, much of the simulation tools are balkanized in the sense that transmission is studied differently, separately from distribution and, and the, the effect of uh, communications on the control strategies are studied separately from the rest of it. And, and, and the, this cannot be done anymore in a, in a much more complicated grid where you've got thousands of uh, EVs or thousands of, uh, um, uh, of, of PVs on the, on the grid itself. So, so we, we need to be able to do that. And that's really falls into DOE's plate very, uh, very well in terms of developing, uh, doing the fundamental research needed to develop these tools. And the development of the tools always depend on the vendors because it, 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 that's what, what uh, it's the vendors who supply these analytical tools. Um, so the, um, so as these tools become available and people start doing these studies, this is the third, third recommendation. These, uh, these studies have to then move up to the third level, the top level of the architecture, uh, where the policymakers and, uh, and, and the regulators can actually see the results of these things and even do some of those studies themselves. So, uh, uh, to be able, so those kind of tools are very much necessary to be able to do, make sure that the that the regulations that people are making are are uh, cap are feasible from uh, from uh, these studies. And finally, the last point here is that uh, um, even after doing lots and lots of simulations, you're still going to go wrong because when the the real system is going to be very uh, somewhat different than others, and so ultimately there will have to be rather large experiments being taken place, field testing of not just a single battery or a, or a single PV, but a, a set of ways to control the grid. How are we, if if we're going to do a lot more decentralized control, we have to run some field testing of decentralized control, which means like a whole region uh, controls have to be tested to do that. So I think that's my last, uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, I think that's that was my last slide. Thank you. Well, thank you to, thanks to all of you uh, for making this presentation. Uh, for those of you who are joining late, this is uh, a discussion on the National Academy's report on the future of the electric grid in the United States. I should mention that this is about the United States. And uh, for those of you also joining late, this is a event uh, organized by the Bits and Watts Initiative of the Precord Institute at Stanford. I have so many questions. I, I can't, I, you know, but, but let me just step back and sort of take a moment to assess where we are. The grid is 120 years old. This, or what you presented, is the, the change that we are going to see. There's so many factors that are pointing to the change that I'm not sure the grid has ever faced this kind of, of, a, of drivers of change. It's probably the first time in history now. It's almost like, you know, flying in a Boeing 737 and you're redesigning and building a supersonic plane while flying without crashing it. Now, it's a, I butchered the analogy, but it, it, it is a, it's a difficult thing. And uh, it is a tremendous opportunity that you have also laid out, but it's also a perfect storm in many ways. And so if you step back for a moment and, and say, how are we going to implement, even if you plan, how are we going to actually see this change happen in the United States? 
And I want to bring this natural tension that we have in the United States of central versus decentral. And you have, you know, we call for a national transmission policy. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And Anjan, you have been talking about this for a long time. And, and that's, that's on one hand, that's, that's important to do that. On the other hand, we have state-wise things. We have the issues about now markets that are, you know, FERC 841 uh, order, uh, 2222, which are, allows digital technologies to aggregate things and take distributed energy things at the, at the distributed end to play in the wholesale market. So that's again, a tension between central versus decentral, decentralized. You have carbon policies or clean energy standards, which President Biden is proposing. Clean energy standards give states the opportunity to design their own on fate, on, on roadmap. Whereas on the other hand, you have a federal carbon tax, revenue neutral carbon tax that George Bush and Jim Baker and all have been pushing. So again, of central versus decent. So if you take the theme of central versus decentralized thing, how do you think we can address this on all of these fronts? If you have thoughts about it, if this came up during your uh, deliberations, we would love to hear that. Let me jump in. So the straight answer is yes, this came up all the time in our deliberations. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not supposed to really share deliberations, as you know well from your own committee work. Um, but I, I, I think now just stepping back without trying to parrot the words that are in our report, clearly this is a tension. And uh, so again, I'm speaking on behalf of myself right now and encourage my colleagues to do so as well. I don't think that our institutions are coping as fast as they need to be with the technology changes that are underway, the cost changes that are underway, the imperatives of things like a climate agenda, and the discussions about infrastructure, for example, at the moment, don't get the urgency of the need to address those questions really fast, not just for economic recovery, but to get ready for the future. The, the discussions in myriad state regulatory commissions, don't, they, they don't have the pace of needing to address these issues fast enough. And so I'm, I'm answering it first by saying, um, Arun, yes, this is really a, a real life tension. I, the committee didn't choose a, a profile for the future that says it's all decentralized, all centralized and so forth, recognizing all of that can be part of the picture. But we also said things are not changing as fast in the man-made systems. The, the again, legal, legal uh, institutional organizational layer. I'll stop there. Maybe I can add something here, Ar uh, Arun, to the debug. As, as Sue said, uh, this came up a lot uh, in, uh, in, in, in the discussions. Uh, I think there's a fundamentally different point in time that we are at that I think is worth kind of thinking about. For the first time, I mean, all this time we said central, central, central because it gives lower costs, better reliability, all the things that you want, things are under control. For the first time, using market-driven forces, we're starting to see the cost of energy and distributed generation starting to drop under five cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's starting to become, you know, uh, have all the attributes that people are wanting and it's market driven. So, uh, you know, that tension is going to only increase now because for the first time, I think in the next three, four, five years, you'll start seeing, you know, commercially viable solutions that could run from the edge. Uh, if the, the center doesn't move fast enough, they'll just disconnect and keep running or something like that. I mean, this is my own personal opinion, but I, you know, I see a very unique point in time where the entrepreneurs and the technologies and the, the commercialization is at a pace that is just not being matched by the central uh, decision makers. So I hope you, you know, you agree with that. Mm -hmm. So let me, let could, me uh, add... go ahead, Arno. Okay. okay, thanks, Anjan. Uh, so if I could add to uh, what Deepak and Sue uh, mentioned, the tension is real. The tension was discussed. Uh, the, the tension was deliberated a, a lot in order to figure out what the right way is to parse it in the report. Um, 
but we also wanted, I, I'd like to mention one uh, thing that the technology uh, chapter, which is chapter five, uh, made an explicit point to address, which is that you can start to parse this tension in different ways and um, uh, delineate what the technological building blocks are that are available, that is feasible, that can re realize different pathways by which you can move from a decentralized to, to a distributed paradigm. Not on Mars, not everywhere, not a total revolution, but in studied ways and in, in specific components so that you can uh, address as to ways in which you can um, embrace distributed generation, you can embrace um, a, a high penetration of electrification of demand, and at the same time provide <clears throat> affordable and reliable power in a resilient manner. So that pathway and the support of different technologies, both from the hardware and from information and control point of view, how they need to be put together and how you can have the market design structures and the technological basis for that in order to implement this change was articulated. But no question that technology does not proceed in a vacuum. And so this is why the points that Sue mentioned are very appropriate that we need to have the appropriate support stru structure to diffuse this tension and figure out ways in which we can um, address uh, these compelling drivers that we have in terms of de decarbonization and, and uh, climate crisis um, and move towards a clean electricity. So, Anjali. So I'll, I, <laughs> I'll hazard a personal opinion here. Um, and so in, in continuation of what Anu was trying to say, um, you know, I, I my personal opinion is, is that the, the, this question of central versus decentral is, is not a real valid question because both will have to exist a long, long time. And uh, because things are, it, it both have advantages and disadvantages, but, both, but some of it will be necessary in all cases. I'll take a couple of examples here. If you think about the market, everybody thinks of this as a decentralized. Uh, thing because everybody is bidding and everybody, every generator is all free to do whatever they want. But actually the, the market solution is a very centralized solution and it's getting more central all the time when you realize that the optimal solution that we come up with, the bigger the optimization space, uh, you're going to get more optimal. Uh, similarly, if we think of just control itself, the two most common controls is, is frequency control and voltage control. Uh, voltage control, people can say, say, okay, so let's make that very decentralized, but nobody thinks of doing frequency control centralized. In fact, in this country, we have decreased our number of balancing authorities dramatically over time. And so that's all central. And the, the real question is, which one is the better option? Which balance, which balance of central versus decentral? And each of these operations will have to be looked at uh, differently uh, or separately. And maybe the answers will come out differently at different regions of the country. It's fabulous. And, uh, and if you're in the audience and you want to ask questions, please do so through the Q&A. And I'm going to transition to that. Before that, I'd like to just add one more. And, by the way, Anjan, that highlights and underscores your point about architecture. Uh, architecture in all its forms, not just in the physical, but even the cyber, et cetera. You, you spent quite a bit of time on innovation and you highlighted how much we are spending or not spending. In your data, what was striking was the absence of China. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about that vis-a-vis, -vis, if you are going to have innovation in the United States, there is at least a thought that perhaps the regulated monopoly structure is not conducive for that. And maybe it is, but maybe it is not. Could you comment a little bit on both those, uh, the international front and China, because they seem to have some of the best high voltage technology um, and they're going international and also how do we do that in the United States? Well, maybe I'll start and then invite colleagues to pile on. Um, the, and, and I should uh, thank the lead uh, committee members, David Victor from San Diego and Karen Palmer from Resources for the Future, who spent a lot of time on this innovation chapter. 
Um, but back to your question, uh, the, the industrial policy character between the United States and China just could not be more different. Um, and that plays out, it, it, I mean, that's the first answer that I have to your, uh, to your question, Arun. The, the drive in China to become the best and then to bring all charging forces to make that happen, not just on R&D, not just on copying other people's technologies, not just then taking that to the next level, but also deploying it and piloting it and getting it into the field. I mean, that is all hands on deck in China. And we aren't there in the United States. And we aren't there for myriad reasons, um, ranging from uh, we have different understandings of industrial policy in Washington, DC, both uh, between the, the houses in Congress, the, the parties in Congress, them vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the executive branch agencies, but also the willingness to see the public good nature of getting ahead in innovation. One of the things that we point to is that for decades, utilities have had, and I'm speaking specifically, utilities have had a difficult time getting approval for investments in R&D from their regulators because you know, the, of the difficulty of capturing and internalizing the benefit of that for one's ratepayers. So that's why the feds really need to play a role. But we, but we also need to see that we're, we've been banking too long in the US on yesterday's innovations and we really need to move that forward. So that's just a touch, uh, I don't wanna occupy the conversation, but that's a touch of a response. So let me uh, add uh, the, this differentiation the broader way of doing things. But I just want to end with suggesting one thing uh, that is not clear at the moment is this thing that about the public good research is being, can only be done by the government because nobody who's building PV panels or, or wind generators are going to worry about the public good as long as the public, as long as the good includes in their equipment. Uh, so in the systems aspect of it, the kinds of things we talked about and the architecture aspect of it, that's where really DOE and government R&D is needed in a big, big way. Maybe I can add, can add a sentence sure. to that, uh, Arun? In, in my mind, I think the most fundamental difference is really that, you know, we've developed our system over the last 50 years or 60 years since Boca, uh, to really assume that the technology is, is going to evolve very slowly and under directed control. Uh, and uh, the whole mechanism has been set up to minimize the risk. So every decision that is made to the utility environment is made to really uh, you know, reduce the risk and to, uh, to manage progression very slowly. Whereas uh, you know, things are moving extremely fast right now. Uh, and uh, you know, whether it's a centralized structure or whatever, but you know, the Ch you know, China is much more uh, open to taking risk uh, and, and, and putting things out and learning from it, uh, you know, we haven't been prepared to do that and we're just sitting on our, uh, you know, royal whatever. <laughs> Let's move on to the audience questions and I'm gonna hand this over to Leon. Thank you, Arul. And uh, uh, thank you uh, all four panelists and speakers. Excellent presentation. And we see a lot of questions. I see all of you are very busy of responding to these questions. In the next 10 minutes, what I'm going to do is combine all, or some of the questions together and uh, echo what uh, the report has been discussed, has been mentioned, and ask you some recommendation or questions. So the first question is about the chapter two uh, regarding the drivers of the changes. Okay. Understand that the committee uh, didn't perform any detailed modeling or use very detailed uh, results from specific model. Instead, the whole committee has chosen to make only some specific forecast about what the future of the grid might look like. That's what Anu mentioned at the first beginning, instead of what will be, right? So the question is, uh, first, can you elaborate a little bit more what's the philosophy of doing that? And the second, the question is, there's a lot of study and the report available uh, right now, talk about decarbon and how the decarbonizing grid may look like, what the study results uh, will tell them to do that. What's your recommendation 
of the data input into these models regarding the demand side and uh, uh, supply side and what kind of forecasting method they should consider, should be careful of. Well, I just, maybe I'll start again um, on this one. The, the committee decided after reviewing the success track record of long-term forecasting that they're, they're always wrong. And they're always wrong because of assumptions such as the reliance on demand side measures, uh, such as the, you know, the drivers for greater efficiencies that end up coming. And so it was a thoughtful reason why we did not rely on our own modeling, because we thought we would be adding to that problem of predicting the future and getting it wrong. And therefore wanted to focus on what are some things that really affect the future no matter what happens or, or what could be drivers. So we thought it was more useful to talk about those than to put out one more forecast. Um, and then certainly the, I, I think the committee did not at all comment on the quality of the data assumptions in any of the forecasts, simply because we, we thought we had enough to do on looking at the other, uh, the other elements. Maybe I can add something here, Sue. I mean, I think uh, we, we looked at, uh, you know, uh, a number of scenarios that we thought could evolve uh, and, uh, you know, which particular one would evolve would depend on which technology matured faster, which got adopted faster, which got uh, buy-in from regulators faster, which, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things, none of which were under anybody's control. Uh, so it seemed to us that it was more important that whatever technologies were invested in, made the grid uh, more adaptive, more flexible, more responsive to changes that you couldn't anticipate fully and plan for. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, DOE also kind of suggested to us that they wanted to see us uh, come up with what they called no regret investment type of uh, strategies. Okay. And I think this is really important. I mean, we've kind of uh, assumed in the grid space that things are going to remain the same forever and ever. I mean, you have $2 trillion of assets. How can you go wrong? And I think you can. I mean, this is the problem. Uh, and uh, so I think this was, this was guiding the, uh, the committee, I think. I can, I can go next. Um, first, let me offer a, um, a personal uh, uh, opinion and then uh, what was discussed in the report the by the committee. Um, uh, the personal comment is I'm a systems uh, uh, person by profession. And so the, what, the question here is how do we go from say 30% renewables to 100% renewables? The grid is a large scale system. So no amount of modeling is going to be able to tell you what happens if you go from 30% renewables to 100% renewables. It'll involve a lot of forecasts. And as was mentioned in, in Deepak's slide and some of the others earlier, any kind of prediction will be inaccurate, false. So that's the main reason why we did not say this is the way in which the grid will evolve. But that doesn't mean that we don't have modeling efforts that were under, you know, that were shared in the recommendations and findings. So the, the committee wide, we discussed quite a bit as to what kinds of modeling efforts need to be in place. We had our modeling workshop that discussed all of the different tools that uh, have to be in place because the grid edge being changing, the modeling efforts and the simulation efforts have to appropriately change. So those kinds of tools, those kinds of recommendations are very much in order and they encompassed both supply generation as well as um, loads. And that was very much, uh, that's, uh, you can see that, you will see that in the findings and recommendations. Yeah, I, I know it makes a really important point. I interpreted that question to be, are you modeling what the portfolio of generation and demand side and, and transmission technologies are going to be going forward? That's the thing we didn't do. We called for much better investment in modeling tools for system designers, that's really needed. And so we did spend, uh, Anja, I'm also looking at you, we spent a lot of time talking to them about that and have recommendations for those kinds of investments. Okay, uh, let's do a quick, because we have very limited time, let's do a quick rapid fire at the, uh, to the chapter five on technology. There's uh, some question uh, regarding specific technology. I'd like to get opinion and uh, from you regarding three specific technologies. One is vehicle to grid. Uh, the second is long 
duration storage. The third one is what's the future of nuclear? Can each of you just comment on one of them and quickly? I, I could start with, uh, you know, certainly, I mean, you know, uh, vehicle to grid uh, is going to be, uh, you know, one of the technologies that will play. It's not clear to me uh, how important it's going to be. I don't think it's going to be a battery issue. If you have, uh, you know, a million vehicles connected and you have a big transient of the grid, they should definitely support the grid. Uh, and, you know, vehicle to home should definitely be a part of it. But the question is, you know, we don't have all the systems in place to make that inexpensively happen. So that's less on V2G. And, and certainly on LDES, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's a critical requirement, but I suspect it's probably going to be hydrogen or ammonia uh, or something like that, a carrier that's going to be able to uh, uh, be generated when possible and, and, uh, and supported. But that's my personal opinion. We, we say everything is possible. If we don't solve the um, long duration storage question, and we push for a, an increasing percentage of renewables, we are going to have a very, very expensive system uh, that's going to be uh, challenged in a, a, a world of high extreme climate change. Yes. Um, so all of these uh, uh, technologies that we are looking at today, um, they, they're all good and they can be used in many different ways. The part which is missing, uh, I think, is that is are they going to be reliable enough are they going to give us the resiliency and by that i mean even if something is very good to do for 90 99% of the time it's that 1% of the time that uh, will get you into trouble and what is the backup for that i mean you talk about the texas situation you talk about the california situation you know it, it's just for a few hours, but we don't know which hours they're going to be, and we don't know what the problem is going to be. So that's the difficult part. And in fact, in some sense, it comes back to Arun's question about, you know, is it centralized or is it distributed? I think as you address that question, all of the host of technology, uh, subsequent questions are driven by that because the technology mix for one kind of a situation, which might, which might be very much the residents, the, the desired solution in one part of the country, is not going to be the same elsewhere. And therefore, the generation mix appropriately will have to defer as well in order to provide a resilient and reliable grid. OK, uh, last question. And uh, this, I'm very glad someone in the audience asked this question. And I'd, I'd like to repeat it again. And what are the challenges recommendation for the workforce training and education? I know that all of you are educators. What's your recommendation give to Stanford faculty and students about involved in the future great research and education? My response is already in the chat. You guys take a look in the answered question from me. And, and what I said there was, we really think that there's a workforce issue both from uh, operating power plants with different technologies all the way down to cyber. That's a huge shortage of talents. Um, we, we call for greater work on understanding this issue funded by NSF as well as support federally for more workforce training. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But also for uh, you know for uh, the, uh, the the workers in the electrified industries, whether it's uh, it's electric vehicles or it's uh, electrification of uh, the chemical industry or whatever, I mean, there's going to be a whole retraining needed for that as well. So the the whenever the workforce training comes up, you know, the professors in the group always jumps up and says, "Well, we need more master's degrees or something like that." Actually, the need is much more in the uh, who's going to put in the PV systems, who are going to. Yeah do the do the EV systems who are going to put in the mic, microelectronics needed to control all of these things. That uh, uh, part of the workforce issue is really, really difficult. And, uh, you know, the, our, our educational system uh, for the training of, of technicians and so on, uh, it doesn't change very rapidly and, and is not very good to begin with. So tell the students this is the coolest area to go into. This is a full employment area for the future. Right, it's not your grandfather's grid anymore. It's going to be entirely different and it, it has a myriad challenges, which and, and AI is really no match for us at this point. Terrific, terrific. Thank you again. I wish we have more time. Thank you again for the excellent presentation and the 
uh, suggestion to our students. I would hand this back to Arun. Well, thank you, Leong. And you know, this conversation can, as you can see, can go on for a long time, but all good things must come to an end. <laughs> Let me just say that on behalf of the country, thank you for putting time and effort and your ideas in, in this report at this moment in time, because as we all know, the electric grid is going through some fundamental changes, which if you don't do it right, will affect our economy, will affect the environment and climate, and will affect our security. And so this is, so this is a historic report, and thank you for devoting time and effort and ideas in presenting the case. And I really, really hope that this is taken up not just by the Department of Energy and FERC, but distributed to all the nooks and crannies of the nation, because, and which is, I know why you're doing the roadshow, but this needs to be adopted and thought through so that it is the, the decentralized part also gets it. And, and also the educators and Anjan correctly pointed out the, the labor that is needed and the vocational training that is needed in addition to the graduate degrees and all of that, that created the workforce to really create the, the 21st century grid, to make the 21st century grid the most important engineering innovation of the 20th, 21st century. So thank you again for taking the time and, and uh, thanks for your thoughts and ideas. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Our so pleasure.